Joining us today in conversation with Power for All is Lee Vale, the Consumer Markets Lead for Solar Nigeria, an award-winning initiative of the UK's International Climate Fund and Department for International Development. Lee has spent more than 15 years in the solar energy sector, leading Shell's strategy to bring decentralized solar initiatives to 12 countries before designing innovative financing funds for off-grid solar solutions in the Indian market. He is now working to transform Nigeria's market for household solar light and power, having designed and established the Solar Nigeria program. Thank you for joining us, Lee. So uh, Solar Nigeria has a mission to transform and scale the public and private markets for distributed solar energy in Nigeria, as well as to increase the number of schools and clinics with solar power. So I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit more about the different aspects of the Solar Nigeria program and its ambitions to create impact in both the private and public sectors? Yeah, sure. The ma majority of Nigerians lack access to electricity. Most would save money and enjoy better service by using solar today. Yet very little solar has been installed in Nigeria. The barriers that are preventing this market from developing are really well understood. So Solar Nigeria aims to help resolve these barriers to allow this latent demand to develop into a large market. By 2020, I see a Nigeria where about 5 million homes will be using solar, accessed on full commercial terms as their main source of power. Solar Nigeria has got a considerable focus on making this happen. We'll support the provision of solar also to over 200 schools and more than 50 health centres, with a focus on the northern parts of the country. So the status, uh, Solar Nigeria is nearly two years into its six-year plan. The initial focus has been to develop stronger foundations for the market to scale. And this has been built around pilots in both the public and private sector. And I'll just talk through those elements of the program and the pilot. The first element is solar for social uses, what economists would call the public sector. In Nigeria, there was a particular challenge. There's been a history of visible, failed solar installations. These were mostly public sector street lighting and some public and donor home system projects. So the first step in Nigeria was a necessity to demonstrate tangibly that the solar technology actually works. People need to see it. The second thing that we wanted to do in this social area initially was to support the early solar champions. To get change in the public sector, it was important to have these champions and to help them drive change. Co-funding a large demonstration project was a really visible way to help those champions start to sell their message. So to do that, we started off with a very large project with Lagos State. It was an initiative of the Lagos State Government and the aim was to meet the power needs, the complete power needs of 200 schools and 11 health centres in remote lower income areas. Uh, DFID contributed 50% uh, of the funding in conjunction with the State Government. Uh, DFID's contribution was £15 million. It was Nigeria's largest ever solar project at 5 megawatt peak. And it's also the largest of its kind in sub-Saharan Africa and was then recognised as uh, best project at the British Expertise Awards. The second part of this was a follow-on demonstration project in Kaduna State, which is in progress now. And that aims to give power to a little over 30 health centres and will be mostly DFID funded. So these were, were largely to just show the nation this stuff works. There's some follow-on activity in social that hasn't been announced yet that will, that will come after these. The second part of the program focused on the private market for commercial power. Uh, in other markets, people might talk about this as rooftop or captive power. Again, in Nigeria, there wasn't much happening here. There were very few privately funded installations in Nigeria for commercial scale off-grid solar. In spite of very low access to the grid uh, or reliable power from the grid and very high cost of power from local generators. The challenges were right through the value chain. So we needed to try and trigger a tangible demonstration to show 
uh, potential users, developers and financiers, that this can actually come together and work in Nigeria. And in supporting a commercial demonstration, it, it let us get better insights into what was really happening at each step in, in the market. So we supported a pilot in a uh, northern state of Kano, working closely with the Nigerian Manufacturers Association. And the aim was to quickly trigger several privately funded installations. To try and help those happen, uh, Solar Nigeria offered a portion of capital grant, around 25% of the capital costs, just to try and get people interested and started. And we had a, a total budget of £1 million for that, although it was not fully subscribed. Uh, that's been really valuable. It showed much better some of the barriers to making these transactions happen in Nigeria. The second part of our work in the commercial scale solar market is to then get mobilisation of commercial finance. Uh, in order to scale up, this is going to be needed and really there's not been any provided to date. So uh, to do that, we've uh, Difford has, has funded the International Finance Corporation to develop a risk sharing facility. The idea will be that using Difford's uh, grant funding, the IFC will offer risk sharing to commercial banks for lending to large commercial solar projects. And that, that piece of work is still at design phase. The third part of the program is uh, the private market for household light and power using solar. The aim here is to enable millions of Nigerian households to access solar light and power systems for their homes and for many of them to enjoy reliable electricity for the very first time. Most Nigerian households lack electricity and they use mainly kerosene lanterns, petrol generators and battery powered lights all at high cost. For nearly everybody solar would provide better service at lower cost but the main constraint is that there's not enough capable solar providers and financiers in place ready to reach the customers. So our aim was to both attract and develop the sort of companies that are capable of scaling the market to the millions. Our target, official target is 2.6 million homes by 2020, although I expect it will be doubled that, something around 5 million. Our first step in the private household market was to run several pilots. The first of these was a capacity building pilot where we offered grants totaling one and a half million pounds. We had applications from over 100 companies and we narrowed that down to 16 companies that were awarded grants, all with the capacity to help scale up this market. We are currently doing a second uh, grant pilot, this time focusing more on mobilising finance. This is aiming to encourage particularly banks and microfinance banks to more actively provide finance for consumers so they can access solar for their home, but also to start providing finance to the companies in the supply chain that will deliver the products to consumers. In the first six months of those pilots operating, we've reached 70,000 homes who are now using small household uh, solar lights and power systems provided on full commercial terms. The next step is to start scaling this up. So Difford has now approved a follow-on program which will offer a little over 13 million pounds of grants through to 2020 uh, in order to help scale up particularly the mobilisation of finance for households. Another important part of, of this activity in the private market is the partnership with Lighting Africa, an initiative of the World Bank Group and IFC. Under the Solar Nigeria program, DFID is co-funding Lighting Africa and Solar Nigeria works very, very closely uh, with, with Lighting Africa. Our programs are a, a perfect complement for each other. Lighting Africa focuses more on product standards 
and really driving sales promotion in the field. And the final leg of this activity in the private markets is seeking to ease regulatory barriers. So we've been advising both DFID and the federal government of Nigeria on the regulatory barriers to the market and helping them work through options to resolve these so that the market can, uh, uh, can move ahead more quickly. That's really impressive. Uh, I have to say, I mean, it, the, you can't uh, discount the impact that this has. I mean, I, I think you know more better than anybody, Nigeria is one sixth of the 600 million plus in sub-Saharan Africa who lack access to electricity. I think I saw somewhere recently, Lee, that uh, there are 100 million diesel gensets operating in Nigeria today. So I just, it's amazing the, the work that you have done, and it sounds like you, you've got even more ambitious plans for the future. So, but with that in mind, I mean, you are, you are combining social and market-based activities into this initiative. And so I'm curious, you know, what have been the, some of the benefits of that approach as well as some of the challenges? Yeah, so each of them arose for its own reasons, but there is interaction between them. One of the benefits of putting the two together was that the social side, in a way, provided a ticket to the game. Uh, the social activity was politically important, in addition to actually you know, addressing the power needs at schools and clinics. So supporting the social activity in such a, a, a strong way helped with establishing the relationships and credibility with the public sector for solar generally. So it, it gave Solar Nigeria and Differed uh, some more credibility. But it also helped the solar champions within the, the public sector to strengthen their case and get a, a stronger voice and influence. And that's really important, particularly when it comes to the regulatory uh, discussions that are, that are still to, to happen. Um, it also gave Solar Nigeria credibility with the private sector players, both local and international solar specialists and banks. They could see that, that we were both serious and expert. So it was much easier to have, to, to get in the door with these people and start the conversation. We didn't have to you know, persuade them that, oh, this isn't you know, just a, a, um, an initiative that's going to waste your time. They knew we had serious money, we knew what to do. And so it made it much easier to get in the door with banks, have really open discussions with some of the, the international specialists in solar that we hope to entice into Nigeria. Some of the challenges though, adding such different activities, so social is fundamentally different from private markets. This added a lot of complexity. The, the two areas really have different skills and disciplines. So social emphasized solar technical uh, skills, project engineering disciplines, they were big solar projects. But the private household market is quite the opposite. It's small standard plug and play systems that are designed once and then sold thousands of times. So you don't need the technical skill. There's no project management. It's consumer sales. So it requires skills in consumer markets, fast moving consumer goods. And they're really quite different disciplines. The second thing was that it in some ways made culture change harder. In order to scale the private market, it's necessary to change thinking of people in, in the public sector um, and the industry itself to understand what the private market is. The, the social activity reinforced the idea of gifts from governments and donors, which is what the history of solar has been in Nigeria. Whereas we need to develop a market paradigm in people's minds where the driving factors are an understanding of the need for commercial viability as the key to scaling a market. And then the ability to understand what commercial viability actually requires in this business. And the third complexity was priorities. The initial program had only a very small budget for private market very large budget for social because it was subsidizing the capital on the social side. So there was this focus on spending large amounts of capital within budget timelines. 
The private market, on the other hand, requires very patient nurturing. It's slowly b bringing people in, one person at a time, slowly building their capacity. It's changing the behaviours of, of people. And that all depends upon other parties making decisions in their own time frame. So there was always this tension in, in terms of the thinking about how to, to run the program. The other big area of challenge is the initial high costs. The social component is very high cost for the actual uh, outcome benefits. And there are two factors for this. One is that it was a high grant contribution in the project, so it, it wasn't user pays. And the second, because these early projects were, were so focused on demonstrating and proving to the nation that solar works, it was critical that they were designed so they would just keep on working no matter what. And in off-grid solar, it costs a lot to design out all of those risks. So the systems were not only designed to the highest standards, but they had substantial redundant capacity as insurance. Now that's paid off. The, the first hospital that or health centre that was installed after, gosh, it's 12 months of operation now, when we go and interview the staff there, they say the lights have never been off. Now in Nigeria, that's something people have never experienced. But it cost an enormous amount to achieve that. So in the follow-on social activities, that kind of cost of system wouldn't be needed, but it was critical for these early ones. Now, when we look at a demonstration in a private market, you can achieve similar benefits at much lower cost because the test of effective systems is lower, but more importantly, the user themselves pays all or nearly all of the cost. The difficulty with relying on the private sector alone to prove that solar works is that it's a longer lead time. So by investing this money in the social side, it was possible to get this big visible project in place early so over the coming years people can keep pointing to it and saying, look, solar just works. Yeah, that's a great uh, that's a great summary, Lee. Thanks. Um, so now I think you, what you said you're two out of six years into the the program. Um, so I imagine that it's given you a chance to see some of the impacts that you're having on both public and private sector markets, and that you're be beginning to see uh, those impacts. I mean, what do you think will be key to catalyzing even greater impact over the last four years of the program and, and perhaps longer, I mean, if, if, if Solar Nigeria extends its lifetime beyond that. Yeah, so I'll touch first on the results we've got to date and then what comes next. So the technical demonstration, the, the Lagos one, which is up and running, has done its job. What we find, and, and this happened very, very quickly, the discussion now in most public sector circles is not about whether solar works, but it's about how to do more of solar, how to fund it, and importantly, how to do it more cost effectively. So that, that's an incredible transition. It happened very quickly. And it wasn't just our efforts, it was other influences as, as well. Um, the second important result was that at the end of last year, the UK government and the Nigerian Vice President signed an Energy Africa Memorandum of Understanding. And this signalled an intention for the federal government of Nigeria to look at reducing regulatory barriers for solar. So this is one sign of the, the importance of supporting the government's ambitions with solar in order to build the relationship. Linked to that, Solar Nigeria was invited to advise the federal government on the state of regulatory constraints uh, to help with their thinking of what issues they might now tackle in the future. And very exciting result is in our first six months since the pilots began, uh, 70,000 additional Ni Nigerian homes are now using solar for light and power every day. And for the first time having reliable electricity. And though that was systems supplied by the companies we're supporting with grants. 
Now what comes next? The key to expanding the household market for solar is to mobilize more financing for consumers and the supply chain, enabling the expansion of the companies that have the capability to take this offer of solar to the consumers, and the easing in some of the regulations that are holding things back. To that end, we, we're in a pretty good place. Um, with the federal government and DFID talking about how to look at easing regulations, it's, a, it's up to the federal government to decide what they do there, but we hopeful that, that some easing will happen. There's better coordination now between the various donors and the federal government so that all of our actions will uh, contribute more effectively. DFID has also committed additional funds uh, and this was really important. It was a sign of their confidence in the work that's been happening so far. This includes an additional 13 million pounds in grant support to help upscale the private market for household solar. Most of that will be directed at the financing side to mobilize commercial finance uh, for consumers and commercial finance for the supply chain through to 2020. And this is really important. In other markets that have scaled quickly, such as Kenya, the constraint for most years was this insufficient finance for the companies to keep growing. So we're trying to get ahead of that one here. By 2020, our internal target is to reach 2.6 million homes with uh, uh, solar lighting and, and power systems, although I expect it's going to be closer to 5 million. Great. So, Lee, that's that's fantastic. One other thing that I was hoping to ask you, if you have a couple more minutes, um, just to sort of, you mentioned Kenya, and obviously Eastern Africa is sort of a first mover in this market. I know you have experience there as well. But how do you see the ECOWAS uh, nations, Nigeria and others in Western Africa, Where what's the timeline for them to potentially catch up to where the market is in East Africa? And I think there's a, a general perception that the markets in the West are a little bit riskier. I mean, I'm just curious to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. So if we compare, first of all, Nigeria with Kenya, um, I think Nigeria is just at the inflection point of moving into rapid growth in the household solar. Um, now, we've seen this not only in Kenya, but in other earlier markets as well in, in Asia. Nearly all the factors are there. If, if you think about the markets as having accelerators and brakes, barriers are brakes, but you still need the underlying drivers of growth. Nigeria's got all the underlying drivers of growth there for this market. It's just got a few barriers still holding it back. So once we remove those barriers, I expect it will grow very, very quickly. Kenya really exploded over a period of about three years. And I expect Nigeria, if we effectively remove these breaks, ease the regulation, mobilize the finance, then um, it's going to explode. And I really do think we can hit the 5 million homes by 2020. Some of the constraints on Nigeria were, for the past 12 months, the currency exchange issue. Now that presented a huge risk for international investors and specialists. They have limited capital and they have choices in where they apply that capital. So some of them we spoke to said, well, you know, we've still got opportunity in Kenya and elsewhere in the East. Why would we risk our capital devaluing by coming to Nigeria yet? Well, the good news is that the Nigerian Naira has now been floated. Um, it's still moving around a bit, and it's a bit higher than it was before, but uh, the exchange rate is a bit less attractive. But at least it's, it's more stable and more certain. That risk of a massive devaluation has, has eased. So that's been a really important factor, I think, now for the next 12 months. Um, there are other companies we know were sitting on the sidelines who could now come in. Well, Lee, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us, and congratulations on all the success you've had, and I'm sure that you will have in the future. Thanks, Will. Pleasure.